Hello, so welcome. This is the final um, part of the first set of videos I'm making on theme one. So it's the third of, of um, the three. So it's um, looking at the final part of the um, political um, change in political environment. So it's theme one C. Um, and so the first couple we've looked at the causes of political instability um, under Charles I. The second set, of course, looked at the failure of the reasons for the, the reasons for the failure to find an adequate settlement during the interregnum and the eventual collapse of Republican rule. And then the final sub theme then looks at um, the reasons why or the, the, re the various different reasons or causes of political instability um, under the restored Stuart monarchy that of course also um, end up with the monarchy collapsing tw just 28 years after being restored. And so we end up with a second collapse of the Stuart monarchy um, within the space of um, well, in the space of about 70 years. And so the focus of this theme, as I said, much like the first one, um, is again on the reasons why government is so unstable throughout the entirety of the restoration. Um, and so there are kind of a variety of different questions that are possible. It could be about relations between monarchy and parliament. It could specifically ask about um, causes of instability, etc. Um, but the overall topic, once again, tends to be quite similar. Um, and most of these points, all these points essentially, are fairly relevant and applicable to kind of these sort of variations of the different types of questions. Um, and so, much like the first time period again, whilst it's not as extreme as the instability of Charles I's reign, the restoration period is still one that's kind of punctuated by some kind of, by, by sort of like constant instability, never quite as, as much as sort, as sort of, for example, the civil wars under, um, under Charles, but it's still quite a tough period. Um, so, for example, you have the um, conflict between Charles and Parliament that sort of kind of carries on from sort of the late 60s, early 70s over sort of his religious, over religious, over religious toleration and the powers of the monarchy. Um, and then you also kind of get the sort of the high point of the period being the exclusion crisis and subsequent crackdown by Charles following the Riot House plot. And then, of course, the kind of the main event of this of this time period is, of course, when um, the Stuart monarchy eventually collapses once again as a result of the disputes between James and Parliament leading to the Glorious Revolution in 1688. Um, and so, again, there are, I feel, not, as always, kind of a range of sort of long-term broad reasons that you can kind of give that repeatedly, as I say, create instability, um, as well as kind of a range of sort of more short-term specific reasons at various points. And so, um, I want to again just sort of go through the key long-term causes or long-term causes of instability. Um, for sort of for this lecture, and then kind of a lot of the short term ones you'll kind of sort of like you sort of pick out yourself. Um, the so the four kind of main reasons you start off, you have of course the restoration settlement of 1660 to 65. So this sort of this series of acts and laws that are passed to basically create a settlement between the king and parliament, in and of itself, is seen to have been quite problematic and the cause of quite a lot of later instability, um, which I'll kind of sort of go into in a bit more detail, obviously. The next issue won't be as significant, but again, is a kind of a recurring theme which continues to plague Charles, um, Charles II, that is much like his father, um, are of course the continued and recurring um, issues of finance that the crown has, and linked to that, the problems of foreign affairs. Linked to that, of course, also as a follow-up, as a follow-up to that, there's also the recurring theme of the fear of Catholicism, which already existed under Charles I, but actually kind of re resurfaces and arguably reaches its greatest extent under Charles and, of course, James after him. And then, of course, that leaves, finally, the personalities of Charles II and James II, um, much like, again, their father had, and linked to it, the fear of absolutism that kind of starts to become quite dominant amongst um, the, um, sort of, um, amongst sort of, throughout the country as a result of the actions of um, Charles and James. So we'll sort of start off chronologically by considering the restoration settlement. Um, because in many ways, a lot of the problems that come about after um, do sort of trace their origins or uh, can, can, can sort of be traced back to the rather problematic um, laws that are passed by the Cavalier Parliament. So the first issue is that the Restoration Settlement arguably created an unclear, or rather very unclear, about the powers of the monarchy and Parliament. If you recall, I said that at the beginning of my first lecture, I discussed how one of the problems was this lack of clarity over where one group's power began and the other ended, and sort of um, creating this kind of strange um, 
often strange circumstances where it's not really clear who's acting in an appropriate way and who isn't. And so the restoration settlement does the ex kind of repeats the same mistake. The settlement does not adequately clarify the separate powers of the monarchy and parliament. And this often leads to challenges to royal actions in the 1660s and 1670s in particular. So as I mentioned when I can, when I, in, the, in the second lecture when I discussed um, the restoration, the convention parliament initially sought to confirm some of the restrictions of the king's power um, that existed after 1640. For example, by retaining the Triennial Act that forced the king to recall parliament every three years um, through parliamentary control of the army, the abolition of the prerogative courts, etc. The problem is, though, that the Cavalier Parliament, again, this rather vengeful, foolish um, parliament, sets about undermining some of the clarity that had been achieved by the Convention Parliament. Um, for example, they replaced the Triennial Act by another version of the Act that is basically weaker in nature in 1664. Um, this new Triennial Act basically has no mechanism for forcing the king to recall parliament if he doesn't actually do it within three years. Then there's, of course, the Militia Act they passed in 1661 that places the king um, or places the king alone in command of the armed forces. And so this kind of clarity of that, that had been achieved by the convention parliament is sort of undermined, and you sort of get a slightly kind of muddy kind of picture um, with regards to... Um, each side's respective powers following the restoration settlement. But then the biggest issue in the restoration settlement, so that's, that's one side, but the really major problem is the impact of the Clarendon Code. Of all the different acts and laws that are passed, the set of laws that are currently referred to as the Clarendon Code, in other words, the religious policies, are what really create problems. Um, and so obviously we'll come back to that in more detail when we look at sub-theme 2b. But for the purpose of this topic, the major issue that the Clarendon Code creates is it puts Charles at odds with his parliament. Charles, as an individual, is somebody who wishes to establish broad religious toleration. The reasons why can sort of be debated. It could be argued that's because he had secret Catholic tendencies, or it could be said that he actually just genuinely believed in toleration. Um, and so this, the Clarendon Code puts him at odds with um, Parliament because the Clarendon Code essentially is a series of laws designed to persecute all kinds of Puritans and dissenters in a very strict and harsh way. Um, and it kind of gradually sort of tightens the net around them to basically expel them from the church and make it almost impossible to preach outside of the established church. And so this puts him at odds with Parliament. And this directly leads to a conflict between the two when Charles attempts in 1672, um, excuse the typo there, to um, suspend the key, to suspend some key laws from the Clarendon Code. Um, so the Declaration of Indulgence specifically um, kind of suspends the Act of Uniformity, which is the act which formally ejects a, um, a large number of ministers from the church who are nonconformists. And so in passing this, he basically, it leads to, it leads to, conflict, to, it leads to conflict between himself and Parliament. And then, this creates even more conflict later on when Parliament rejects the law and passes something referred to as the Test Act, which forces any public office holders to deny key Catholic beliefs. Again, I mentioned it in the second lecture. And this obviously eventually leads to the resignation of his brother James, who is a public Catholic, as Lord Admiral from the Navy. And so the, the Clarendon Code puts Charles at odds directly with Parliament, so it naturally kind of creates um, instability kind of problems and, and problems of government as a result. And the final issue, of course, with the restoration settlement is the financial problems that it creates. And so the settlement basically provides the king with an independent income. However, the income they provided him with was not, was not, was not sufficient enough for Charles's needs. And so much like his father, Charles, as a result of the restoration settlement's quite adequate um, income it, that it grants him, has to um, constantly go back to Parliament to make demands for taxation, which end up weakening his relationship with them. Um, so, for example, they, 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 so linked to that, they, they bring in this um, half tax as, as, as a result of the, of the restoration settlement, which is supposed to kind of give him regular taxation, but it provides him in the end significantly less than it was expected to do. And so, um, Charles, like his father, is unable to break. Um, Parliament's financial control over him, and so much like his father, leads to many of the same issues, in particular when it comes to foreign policy, and also at the same time, arguably leads to him pursuing a particular kind of foreign policy that is quite problematic, which I'll kind of develop later on. Um, and that is a foreign policy which basically puts him in alliance with the French 
and um, at war with the Dutch. And so early foreign relations are a particular problem, or rather the, in the first problem that Charles faces as king. Um, and he kind of faces quite a lot of popular discontent over both the course and the outcome of the Anglo-Dutch wars. So to begin with, Charles already creates problems of parliament by allying himself with Catholic France um, in their campaign to destroy the Protestant Dutch Republic, who of course parliament being Protestant largely sympathised with. So that's the first problem. So from the outset, they're not happy with Charles waging this war. To make, it, to make matters worse though, the war itself is actually, is actually a disaster. So the English are basically humiliated when they try to, when the Dutch launch a raid on the Medway River and basically destroy and break, break, break through the blockade there and destroy the entire English fleet which is being anchored there. And so um, it's a disastrous, disastrous result. It ends up with the um, English having to, having to sign quite a terrible treaty with the Dutch. And so Charles kind of in response is forced to use his, um, is forced to use his main advisor, the Earl of Clarendon, who's after whom the Clarendon Code is named, as a shield to basically take the blame, and he basically replaces him with a group of councillors instead um, to sort of make him the fall guy, and sort of that's kind of the sort of the, the punishment for the campaign basically goes to Clarendon. So you have this issue of the Anglo-Dutch Wars, um, but then even worse, or the situation the situation gets even worse a few years later when in, when 1672 Charles renews the war again. And it's once again a massively unpopular, um, it makes a massively unpopular um, conflict. And he initially tries to avoid recalling Parliament. The problem is, and that's, that's also partly related to him declaring, passing the Declaration of Indulgence. The problem is, of course, the lack of money to finance the war means he basically has to declare himself bankrupt. And so that forces him to once again recall parliaments. And so with that parliament being recalled, it puts him at odds with, well, he's at odds with that parliament in the context of the Declaration of Indulgence, which he passed um, that, that previous year. And so parliament forces him to withdraw the Declaration of Indulgence, otherwise they will not grant him any taxation. So Charles is forced to kind of give way to parliament's demands as a result. And so, so they so you have this issue, so, so kind of you, you get these kind of very, these various issues to, um, coming about as a result of um, foreign affairs and, and, um, and money. The major issue though which Charles faces, and so the single biggest problem that Charles faces, and so you can, you'll often get questions that phrase it using by French Catholicism, and I think it is actually a valid point, is the fear of Catholicism. It's something which has not gone away, and in many ways, it is what li it is the core reason which lies behind lies behind much of the parliamentary opposition towards Charles, and that is the fear of Catholicism, and linked to it the concerns, the increasingly serious concerns that Charles is pursuing a pro-Catholic agenda. Um, and there's, there's, there's also a few things which kind of lead into this lead into this um into this fear. So there's obviously the fact that um, there is this strong opposition to Charles's declaration of indulgence. And the reason behind that opposition is, the, is mainly due to the fact that it includes Catholics. So he doesn't just lift religious toleration by um, lifting the persecution of Puritans and just general dissenters, but it also includes Catholics, which is the first issue. Second as well, what compounded that fear is that only a few years earlier, um, his brother had actually converted to Catholicism. Um, and so yeah, that obviously kind of raises concerns. And then you also mix with that the fact that he had been in alliance with Catholic France for so many years, and um, and kind of given the years he spent living in France before he actually came to England. And so again, you suddenly get a picture and sort of the dots being the dots are sort of being put together, and it seems quite likely that Charles is, if not a Catholic himself, most certainly very pro-Catholic in terms of the agenda he's following. And so this leads to, to this leads to conflict and disputes breaking out between himself and his parliament in the 19, in, the, in the 1670s. That's the first thing. Um, and then, of course, the fear of Catholicism can be, um, or you can attribute to the fear of Catholicism, the single greatest threat to the monarchy throughout the Restoration period, and that is the Popish plot and the exclusion crisis, which follows on from it. So this kind of bizarre fear of Catholicism is what essentially enables this um, popish plot, sort of this, this mass hysteria of the popish plot to basically come into effect throughout the century. Um, so to sort of just go over this kind of, this, the, the details again, so the popish plot, you basically have this supposed um, conspiracy uncovered by this guy Titus Oates, a former Jesuit, to murder Charles and install his brother James as king in his place. And so um, 
in response to the really huge parallel public who basically believe it to begin with, um, you have this new Whig faction in Parliament gaining a majority and ascendancy in the 1679 election that Charles calls. Because um, of the political context, um, this Whig faction are very anti-Catholic, um, are basically able to kind of go into the ascendancy in Parliament. And so in bringing this Whig faction into power and the kind of the public atmosphere it brings about with it, this allows the Whigs, led by the Earl of Shaftesbury, to begin a to begin a series of, of serious a series of events, um, attempts rather to exclude James, um, so James II, Charles's brother, from the succession in favour of his son, his his illegitimate son, the Duke Monmouth, the Protestant Duke of Monmouth, and so Charles is desperate to defeat this what he considers to be this quite serious challenge to the idea of divine right monarchy. Um, and so, this, this, so, so this, the entirety of the exclusion crisis, I won't, I won't kind of go over the details again, I've kind of discussed that in the first lecture, um, but it's clearly a significant challenge to the monarchy and a, and a kind of a major point of instability, and it is entirely caused by the fear of Catholicism that allows the popish plot to reach the kind of bizarre um, mass hysteria it ends up reaching, or it ends up creating. And so we can once, we, so we can once again blame it on the fear of Catholicism, we can blame a high point of instability on the fear of Catholicism. Um, the final way in which you can argue, of course, that the fear of Catholicism creates um, instability is the most significant event of this period, which is, of course, the Glorious Revolution. And so it is the fear of Catholicism that ultimately leads to, leads to resistance against James and the Glorious Revolution in response. So the policies of James, when he, when he succeeds Charles and becomes king, are basically witness or basically contribute to the end of Stuart rule due to the fear of Catholicism. Um, James, as a Catholic, begins to promote Catholic interests almost immediately upon becoming king, um, and so he does sort of things like promoting promoting some some um, army ops, promoting some Catholics as army officers. Um, he issues a new declaration of indulgence that establishes religious toleration for Catholics and dissenters, much like his brother did. Um, he also kind of often um, he often intervenes in either institutions or groups by promoting Catholics at the expense of Protestants. So famous example of where he replaces a group of Protestant fellows at Magdalen College, Oxford, with Catholic fellows instead. And so there's this fear that not only is James um, attempting to um, allow a sort of equal, equal rights and status for Catholics, he's also actively promoting and trying to achieve Catholic supremacy. And so these are all policies that, that yeah, that kind of that, that raise fears that he is trying to um, establish Catholic superiority in the country. And so this, of course, again, linked to the first Catholicism, this builds tension that is unleashed after the birth of a healthy son to James in 1688, which suddenly raises the fears of a Catholic succession. So up until this point, James, as I, as I mentioned in the, in, the, in, the, in the first couple of lectures, James was an old man who, was, who only had one daughter, a Protestant Mary, who really wasn't going to be able to have a child. And then to the shock and horror of the rest of the country, he gives birth to a healthy baby boy through his young wife, Mary of Medina. Um, and so there is this genuine fear that we're now potentially going to have a permanent Catholic supremacy and monarchy and succession in this country. And so this triggers the political elite as a result to unite um, to unite with each other, these, these kind of groups and factions that hate each other, sort of Whigs and Tories, and invite William and Mary to invade England and take the crown. And so this kind of, this main challenge to the Stuart monarchy and this um, this kind of, in many ways, kind of high point of instability um, can be attributed again, once again, to the fear of Catholicism and the way it triggers um, the Glorious Revolution as a result. And then the final couple of, the, the final way which can be argued though, or the final way, the final point that could be caused rather of instability and kind of issues between parliaments and, and, and the monarchy can be once again attributed to the personalities of the figures at the top, in particular the kings here, Charles II and James II. And in particular, um, they're sort of similar traits to their father in regards to their views on divine right kingship, and then the fear of absolutism which this then triggers. So Charles and James, like their father before them, both view themselves as divine right kings, appointed and answerable only to God, and therefore they often act in this way, in particular through their over-reliance on prerogative powers to basically put through, to, to kind of adopt the laws and kind of have their way. So this is made worse by the fear of royal absolutism that had become quite prominent 
due to recent events in France. Um, and also the fact that Charles was allied with the French who were basically, well, yeah, so the, fact, the fact that Charles in relation was also allied to the French. And this then ends up being linked um, with the fear of Catholicism as well. So the, kind of the fear of Catholicism and the fear of royal, royal absolutism are the, are, are the same. So just to give you a bit of context about that. So the issue is that their cousin, Louis XIV, because of course their mother is the French Catholic, um, Henrietta Maria, um, their cousin Louis XIV um, had established an absolute monarchical rule or absolute monarchical government within France in a very centralized state in which he basically exercised a high degree of personal power and rule. So you look at kind of Charles's personal rule in the 30s, it's basically that on steroids. Um, so he exercised this very significant degree of personal rule and control. Um, and then linked to that as well, he had also revoked protections for Protestants and begun persecuting them. And so people look across the channel and see what happens in France, um, with this kind of the series, this kind of royal absolutism, and find it quite and see it as quite a terrifying prospect. Um, and so there's a fear, again, given the quite obvious links between Charles and James and their cousin, and also kind of what they're doing, that they are potentially adopting a model akin to what is being implemented by their cousin and ally. Louis XIV in France. And so this once again raises serious concerns um, within sort of the political nation about the intentions and, and sort of actions of Charles and James. And the reason being is, as I mentioned, um, there are kind of a few examples of how both Charles and James have this tendency to constantly fall back on autocratic methods to achieve their aims if necessary. Um, so again, just gonna roll through a few of the, kind of key, the, the key examples here. Um, if we go back, to the um, Act of Indulgence in 1672. I mentioned how part of the controversy was it lifted um, restrictions on Catholics, but actually in many ways what really made it controversial wasn't the, um, the actual law itself, but was rather the use of the royal prerogative by Charles to actually, um, to, 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 as, as, the, as, as the declaration put it, to dispense with the law. So he basically claimed the right of Charles to dispense with laws that had basically been passed by Parliament. And so the idea of the Declaration of Indulgence was Charles was personally suspending the Act of Uniformity and claiming prerogative powers to do that. Again, raising the fears of royal absolutism and the idea of Charles as an autocrat. Um, moving forward as well, kind of Charles's actions, um, his handling of the exclusion crisis and also the events after it, they see Charles constantly kind of dissolving parliament, arresting Shaftesbury Shaft's for treason, um, the way in which he uses the Rye House plot to um, avoid calling parliament for the rest of his reign. Again, they kind of just raise these fears that Charles is an absolutist monarch aiming to kind of emulate his cousin in France. And then of course, James does the exact same thing. So again, it's not, it's not, it's bad enough that James is um, trying to promote Catholic supremacy, arguably, but what's worse is he does it once again using prerogative powers due to Parliament being uncooperative. Um, so again, personally promoting officers within the army, intervening in court cases to prevent the um, proper functioning of anti-Catholic laws, personally expelling the Oxford Fellows, um, again, like his brother having another declaration of indulgence. Um, he has again seen to be an autocrat who's forcing his will upon the nation. And so, in many ways, the opposition that is faced by both men could also be seen as a reaction to the autocratic methods that both men adopt. And so again, it's this, very, it's this, it's this recurring, a lot of recurring themes um, in terms of the opposition that their father faces, kind of fears of Catholicism, fear of their nature and kind of their attempts to kind of act in a kind of absolutist way and kind of the tensions that raises. Um, and so you can look at this, this kind of final long-term trend that plagues the um, two men up until the end, and again, arguably leads to um, the collapse of the Stuart monarchy. Um, and that's the final point then that I will kind of go over. There are sort of a kind of a range of um, short-term points you can mention that kind of create instability, some of which I've mentioned as part of these long-term issues. Um, but in general, as I say, it's often best to think about things in terms of these long-term trends um, and have kind of various pieces of evidence to support them. Um, just in case it's sort of, um, just in case you um, kind of have a more restricted question and therefore you can sort of pick out that same long-term argument, but a particular piece of evidence to go alongside it. Um, and so that of course then brings us to an end of the first theme. That was the final of course sub-theme that I was going to cover. Um, again, I hope you found that um, quite useful. Um, any kind of questions or comments you have, leave them in the, um, in the, leave them in the comments below and I'll try to respond to them. I want to say as a last point as well, 
Um, whilst this is only really just one theme out of four, in many ways, if you look at the trends of past paper questions and how the kind of course is structured, um, in theory, it is weighted equally with the rest, but in practice, what appears to be the case is, this theme one appears to be um, almost guaranteed to come up in section A, and quite often they will have two questions from section A alone, sorry, from theme one alone. And so um, it is really important that you have a, a, a solid grounding understanding of the kind of core narrative of the time period and really kind of just drill down and kind of understand, kind of preparing for, to answer questions about instability, causes of instability in this time period. Um, and then hopefully, yeah, that will um, bear fruit and you'll find that you're kind of in luck when you open your exam on um, that fateful day. Thanks for listening.